What are we starting with this week? Uh, ooh, 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 Spotify, Spotify, Spotify update. update. A Spotify update. Well done to both of you. Congratulations. I'm very proud of you. We have 23,100. 21,400. Oh, That's less than last now. time. Is it? No. I don't think so. I don't it's gone up by a couple is. hundred. It's gone up by like 200. It's gone up by a couple yeah. hundred. Yeah. To be fair, last time was maybe a couple weeks ago and we're recording this very early. So we've also got 31,000 listeners, which is very nice. Cool. And over half a million starts. As in, over half a million people have started our podcast. Even accidentally. Yeah, even accidentally. Yeah. But about half, about half a million have streamed it as well. So that's good. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. That's really nice. Here's to the next million. Now, I have a question for our audience. Hello, audience. If you are watching, get to the comments. And if you are listening, get to the comments as well. Go to youtube.com forward slash SciGuys and answer this question. What is your sexuality? Are you straight or gay or any of the other ones? Out Let yourself. Us know. None of your business. Immediately. You yeah. Don't want to out yourself? You don't have to. Just comment. Wait, no, that would out. Everyone just comment something like bear. And if you want to, if you isn't bear, uh, bear is a gay thing. Yeah. So you'd be outing yourself. No, you wouldn't be because no. everyone's putting bear. If everyone comments bear, and then some people also just comment well, their sexuality, that, that bears, then it's yeah. fine. Okay. And if you're straight as well, just don't say anything. Okay. That's, that way that's we won't out sexuality. anyone. That way we won't out anyone. <laughs> there you go. Solid. So let's start the show. Yeah. <laughs> let's start the show. This is a flawed system. Hello and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jamp and Luke Kupfer, hello. and special guest, Dr. Jamie Rains. Oh, hello. Thank you for having me. Doctor's in the house. Oh dear. I can't save your life. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the point in you then? There isn't one. Okay. <laughs> this week, we're talking about Jammy Dodger science. <laughs> oh, that's you. <laughs> I'm done now. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do your PhD thesis on Jammy Dodgers? Yes. Cool. I know everything about biscuits. Cool. So not on Jammy Dodgers, about biscuits then? Biscuits in general. It includes Jammy Dodgers. Yeah. Okay. What Jamie actually did his PhD <laughs> thesis on was, I think, closer to transgender sexuality. Was that... Is that is that kind of accurate? It's not quite. To an, well, not, to an yeah. extent, there is a there's sexual arousal. There's a little bit of sex. <laughs> Forgot the word. Sex. Atypicality. There you go. Oh. <laughs> oh, look at that. Yeah. I, got a, I got a little expert. I little remember expert in the room. my own research. Yeah. I read it. I read it. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday and today and a few other days as well. It really stuck with me. No. So what would you say if you would describe your, your thesis? What would you say it's about? Trans people. <laughs> As, that was like the start of the thesis it was like hey i want to do some research on trans people because there is no decent research out there especially trans men mm. there's like nothing so that's just where i started from and i was like how do trans people behave in childhood how does this happen and then my supervisor worked in a human sexuality lab and that's how the arousal stuff came about ah. i didn't initially want to do it that's interesting, yeah. yeah. So you'll find out in a bit. Uh, Jamie's, Jamie did some work on um, arousal, uh, specifically in regards to trans people, and also it, looking at the sort of sexual orientation as well, and how that and how that played into it too. Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit, in a little mm. bit. But first, I want to talk about the sort of background um, of trans people in science, not trans people in science studying science, the other way around, studying trans people in science. Because like you said, it's... It's not good. It's not great so far. I mean, you you both have noticed this, surely, in, in the episodes that we've done before. Yeah, you're constantly having to go, okay, so these are trans oh, women, yeah. but in, in the in the in the in the document it says a different thing, and I'm reading the document, and that's really bad, but this is what we're having to yeah. There was the other week as well when it they were talking about boys with gender dysphoria. So um, but they meant most trans of them girls. Be girls. Mm -hmm. But they yeah. but they, well, that was the thing. They didn't they didn't stipulate well they didn't say whether they then went on to transition or not and it became very confusing oh when, some of them did and some of them didn't, some of them right? didn't didn't I, yeah. I, I think this might have been a bonus episode actually I think we were talking was, about this yeah. out of interest um because obviously there's the way you can read that which is that these people are not clued up on how to talk about these things but then the, there's the other way of reading it which is that at an early age if you're showing signs of gender dysphoria but you also might not go on to transition you aren't yet. Yeah, you are a male with gender transport, trans, trans, 
uh, gender dysphoria, I guess. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Would be more helpful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, my, my point is, when this has come up in the papers that I've read, it's always been difficult in that um, it's it's not necessarily that they're, it, they're not clued up on what they're talking about. Obviously, they, to some extent, they seem to understand what they're talking about because they're scientists studying it. They know what they're, it's, more the, it's more the disconnect between the way that it was spoken about in those papers and the sort of so, where we are socially with it and you know, the general sort of public. I think what was really mm. good about what you did with your um, thesis, I'm going to be specifically referencing things that you've said and done. Oh, great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was really, it was really, as in I really, I really like this, how at the, at the start, you gave an explanation of obviously what being transgender is, mm -hmm. but then you, you said, this is what this is what it would be referred to sort of scientifically. Mm -hmm. This is how I'm going to talk about it because X Y Z this makes the most sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I had to like argue with mm. my supervisor to use what I deem to be the correct terms because like if you read other papers, they would describe like a gay trans guy as a heterosexual transsexual female, and like to me that's really confusing and doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was like absolutely not like to my supervisor i was like he was very receptive but just he'd come from like part of this research that used those old-fashioned terms like his super his supervisor did that yeah so he took a while to like understand what i wanted to do so i had to like properly be like no this is the term i'm going to use mm. and that's why we were kind of like it needs this explanation and then you went one step further as well and i've literally i've actually got the exact quote here it, it says, uh, despite agreement to define sexual orientation to be based on gender, to avoid any confusion, the present research will therefore, wherever possible, focus on sexual attraction to men or women mm -hmm. rather than using any sexual orientation labels. Which, as someone who reads papers like this weekly, was mm. so, so straightforward and so nice. Yeah. It's honestly, it, I think, I think this is, outside of the, the actual research that you've done, just the way that you've conducted writing your paper is just so great because there's always Thank the you. i mean that's all done good job, good job. <laughs> uh, this is just going to be an episode of gushing about jamie so everyone oh please no i don't take compliments, don't take compliments okay well. <laughs> is that why you're doing this i'm going to try and get them out of the way Aww. first and i'm going to try and get them out of the way at the start okay and then we'll just get into actually the research okay but cool. the way that you conduct the way that you conducted sort of writing the papers i mean you i think you two might have noticed this before that um obviously in the papers that i've read it can be it can be really complicated to parse out what they're talking about what, they're, what they actually mean exactly and there's <laughs> there is this sort of argument from some members of the, <laughs> of the sort of scientific community that well this is what makes this is the most scientifically accurate scientifically accurate and makes the most sense and is the easiest way to but ultimately it's it's not and i think what you've written here makes it clear that you can be both scientific in your language and be incredibly clear because ultimately um and this is a part of a larger issue Scientific papers are very difficult to read for lots of people mm -hmm. because you need to learn specifically how to read them. And ultimately what they should be is readable for anyone with a decent sort of background knowledge or a decent level of knowledge. But far too often you find overcomplications and and, and, and just difficulties in the way things are described, um, which almost keeps people out of science, which almost puts a sort of barrier to most people being able to engage with it. And I think that this is honestly um, not an example of that. I think it's very, very... Very readable. Good job. Thank you. No more compliments. Okay, no, good. No, Yay. No. <laughs> All insults from here. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, if we're looking at the sort of background that you talk about um, in this, because there's a sort of lit, lit review at the start, um, you're talking about kind of the um, the sort of prevalence of uh, being transgender and being LGB um, outside of that, mm -hmm. and how a lot of the research on these topics that you're about to look at, that you're about to sort of study in the... I say you're about to, uh, that, you, that you did, that yeah. you looked at. Yeah. The research is really, really lacking, mm -hmm. um, which, yeah, it, it's, it really seems to be. It's really, mm. it's really interesting. I mean, have you got anything to say on what you kind of did um, that was different than most people in the research prior? I just remember like thinking, I want to research trans people because I'm trans. Yay, let's do this. I know about <laughs> it. And then every time you do research or you start a study, you have to have like a basis of previous work mm -hmm. to kind of jump off from. And I was like, yeah, but everything that people have done previously is all about sexuality and not about gender or trans people. Mm. And the stuff that is about trans people talks about like autogynophilia mm. and it's just terrible. Um, so that's kind of where it all started from. But it was difficult to find a footing within the current science to like have a base from for mine. 
Uh, that was fun. That's that was really good. <laughs> it's, it's really it's it's really great. And for anyone that, that's uh, watching or listening and doesn't know, um, do you guys know what autogonophilia is? AGP. Is it something to do with trans women allegedly? being attracted to themselves or their own, like, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it properly, but I know the, the general gist. Yeah. So uh, there's the, there was this idea that trans women come about through being sexually attracted or s getting sexual gratification from the idea of them being, being a woman, being a woman or right. having a vagina, yeah, yeah. Um, which I've read the, I've read the papers. I actually have. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> nah. <laughs> and that the person who like did so much work in that field on autogynophilia was my supervisor's supervisor which is why i had to do so much unlearning with my supervisor i didn't know this when i first went into it and the first meeting i had with him where i was like he's a lovely guy by the way i'm not dissing my supervisor yeah. he just had no knowledge and his knowledge base was from somebody who was like mm, eh, not great um and so the first meeting I had with him, I, I told him I was trans and I wanted to research trans people. He gave me a book uh, called The Man Who Would Be Queen by Michael Bailey, which is about autogynophilia because he thought I was an early stage trans woman. Jesus. And I was like, this was a terrible book to give me if that's what you thought, because this is a terrible thing. Um, he did oh, not mean God. anything bad by it. Yeah. But, oh, I read that book and it made me angry. I, I mean, so. I can imagine. <laughs> I think I think it's as well, It's it's, it's it kind of points to how the those those awful ideas propagate propagate in the scientific community and people just don't people don't know that their views are really horrible because i've seen a lot of turf mm -hmm. use that um research as uh look we have science on our side despite the fact that a lot of it yeah. is really old mm. and really really like really poor we could maybe do an episode on it at some point but um let's not get too deep into it <laughs> so <laughs> it's really it's really yeah. it's really fairly done um so yeah, I mean, the, the, the thesis is basically on uh, transgender people and kind of stepping out from the, the sort of stuff that was done before, which is mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, you kind of talk about sexy typicality mm -hmm. uh, se and then you kind of go on to the sort of um, arousal as well. I mean, when starting research for this episode, I thought, Oh yeah, let's just let's just look at let's just look at the whole thesis. Let's just look at that. That'll be fun. Too much. <laughs> it's too much. Um, you wrote a lot. Makes sense. I kind of forgot how, how dense the HD thesis would be. It's exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't request anybody to read it. It's a lot. Because yeah. there are there are sort of three main parts to it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. three main parts of the research. There's the um, there's the atypicality, mm -hmm. the um, the sort of arousal aspect, which is what we're going to be looking at today. Because mm -hmm. I found it really interesting, and there's some really sort of um, quirky things that you did in there that I think uh, a lot of people listening will find really interesting. Um, and actually, I distinctly remember you telling me about your PhD when we met. And I was yeah. like, wow, I'm going to get you on to talk about this one day. I so think you said that when, we, when I first told you about it. You were like, I want you to talk about this. Yeah, because you, you, yeah. yeah. But at the time it wasn't published. So I was like, maybe when it's like published. Yeah. Up, yeah. Which yeah. it is. Yeah. Which is uh, amazing. And then the third part is about the well-being aspect. Mm -hmm. Which um, is, again, it's really, mm -hmm. it's really good. So um, the sexual arousal. I mean, I want to perhaps ask Jamp and Luke oh. how you think um, sexual arousal would be measured in a laboratory setting. Oh, Blood flow to either genital, genital region. Oh, don't look at me for the answer. Blood flow Sorry. to <laughs> genital region. <laughs> Essentially, yes. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, do you want yeah. to do you want to describe the do you want to describe the the tools that are that are used? The tool. Oh my, that's, that's like, <laughs> oh. I, I do want to just like make it clear it's all done in privacy. So we had like this really mm -hmm. private booth, so we didn't see anything. So there are like two different devices we used: uh, a penile gauge and a vaginal probe. The penile gauge basically measures blood flow into the penis mm -hmm. as people get aroused, and the vaginal probe it measures. Um, it's like it measures light. So it measures the pulse in the vagina mm. as as uh, kind of like blood flows into it and it bounces light off of the vaginal walls. <sighs> like to, those old apps where you put your finger up against your tor the torch on your phone and it measures the kind light of. <laughs> go through your skin. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Right. But yeah. And Maybe it was similar like, to how the Apple Watch does it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same, right. same yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. And it sounds really it's like vaginal probe, but it's like the size of a tampon and it's not very intrusive. <laughs> but, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I mean it's intrusive for like coming into a lab and taking part in an experiment but it's pretty it's very okay mm, yeah. yeah and it's um the, the <laughs> it's described in the paper as vaginal do you know how to pronounce this I'm plethysmograph yeah, okay there we go plethysmograph or photo pl plethysmography yeah it's a yeah. tough one can i ask uh, can i ask a probing question oh, <laughs> nice when you got the device that measures 
blood flow to the penis, mm -hmm. how does it do that? Is it like, oh, like one of those things you get a nurse puts on your arm? Basically a rubber band. Right. So it's like, it's, it's got like mercury in it. It's got something in it. I don't think it's mercury. It used to be. But it's got something in it and it's just like stretchy and you put it over the penis about halfway so down. Diameter wise. Yeah. And then it just, but it's not accurate. So like, although we could see when people were getting aroused, we could tell like roughly a change in size, but we couldn't tell like it wasn't accurately right, measuring yeah. the girth of somebody's penis. No, yeah. <laughs> Cause that would be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you grew <laughs> <laughs> Um And I think uh, what you what you then talk about there is, as well, and, and basically what we're doing right now is we're kind of just going through chronologically how I read, how I read, the, how I read the thesis. You then talk about the different, um, so, the different, obviously, the different, the two different methods of measuring um, arousal, but you talk about how this um, would work with trans men as well, mm -hmm. because you've got you've got some interesting stuff there. Because you talk about the two different, well, the two main different types of mm -hmm. um, sort of uh, surgery uh, to create a penis, and how those would or wouldn't work with mm -hmm. um, with basically the, the methods to measure arousal. Do you want to talk about? Do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, sure. Um, so. Obviously, to be able to measure arousal on a penis using the the like the rubber band, uh, it needs to get like naturally erect. So with phalloplasty, that doesn't happen. So that was kind of ruled out as an option. But with metoidioplasty, it would, except it's significantly smaller than the average penis and therefore the average penile gauges. But accidentally, the company that we order the gauges from sent really small ones like they, they weren't like a normal size that was on the listing or anything they just kind of appeared and there was a handful of them and i was just like hey these look like an appropriate size <laughs> i could use these because like my supervisor was like yeah we got sent these ones and he was like going nobody can use these like what are we meant to do with these and i was like actually I'll use them. <laughs> i can use these and that's where i got it's like a complete accident just like these wow. random sizes that got sent over and i was like i can make use of that and it just it works in the exact same way it just had to be that smaller size because it needs to be reasonably tight when it initially goes mm -hmm. on otherwise it's not going to measure anything which is i mean it makes sense that they would it makes sense that they would make them in that size anyway because obviously like i mean when when i ran out of them we couldn't order any more really yeah that's interesting because really? just just through based again based on what you have written down here mm -hmm. um you've, you've spoke about sort of the um a, a little bit a, a little bit about metodioplasty and about how generally it creates a penis that is roughly analogous in size to sort of micro penis mm -hmm. um like one to three inches mm -hmm. um which to me would be like oh well surely you would want to you'd want to be able to measure arousal in has no one ever done arousal with, on, on sort of men with micro penises before really like the fact that you like you know sure. you were the first <laughs> you were the first group to do that that's that's I mean, wild it's um it would depend on i don't think anybody's specifically been mm. like hey cis guys with micro penises come in and like let's see how we measure your arousal compared mm. to like an average penis size and it's a specific type of person that comes in to take part in this research yeah, fair. and i think you'd be like unlikely to find anybody who had any kind of discomforts which would potentially be more likely in people with a micro penis not that's definite enough. but yeah. you know it's not happened yet but I, yeah, I do know that the guy that would order the stuff for us was like, it's not actually listed to order any more in this size. <laughs> um, so maybe it is now, <laughs> but it was a fluke that we ended up with them. So I don't know how that happened. Oh, that's, I mean, I'm, I'm glad it did. Yeah, it's very yeah, lucky. Yeah. So you didn't. So you well, so you didn't have that aspect of the sort of um, paper until you got those sent sort of sent accidentally then. Well, they were just in the lab. So when I got introduced, when I like okay. first became. Um, a student, I did a master's first and, and like I did my undergraduate project with the same supervisor. So when I first became like part of his lab and doing work, he took me into the lab and showed me how it worked and I had a look through it and then we discussed how I could maybe incorporate that. And then I saw the little gauges and I was like, well, this yeah. is one way. Well, that's awesome. That's great. No, I love that. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of, I mean, that's kind of a good almost baseline for um, talking about what you actually studied then, I guess, right? And like the sort of results that got mm -hmm. and, all, and all of that. <laughs> so I think, um, I mean, I'll give what I what I thought, and then you could probably correct me and say say what you actually. Or I do mean, you want to just say what it was? No, that no, you go for it because honestly, I've not read my thesis in over a year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not familiar there anymore. No, so if we if we look at the arousal uh, aspect of it, um, you were talking about this is something that I think we might have spoken about before in the podcast briefly. Um, do you two, either of you, know mm -hmm. the 
sort of any differences generally between men and women um well it's, i mean really in the re in the sort of studies would be in the sort of research um up till now it would be cisgender men and women mm -hmm. um the differences in arousal between those two groups as in who they are mm. aroused by oh uh if you knew the answer it's you would you would know you would you would know but the question wouldn't make sense if you don't know the answer okay, it's totally fine no. um so essentially um most women showed genital arousal to both genders regardless of whether they yeah like what they say they are someone mentioned this to me the other day I, maybe it was you it's basically there's this idea that all women are bisexual i definitely didn't i definitely did not say that um but we have spoken about that before um is that the idea it's like the sensational like headline after the research is published but it's not like it's not the research isn't like all women are bisexual it's just saying that like genital wise cis women show arousal that can be like discordant with the actual sexual attraction that they feel their genitals yeah. just get aroused even if that's not how they're feeling fascinating um, well what did you what did you decide to do on the back of that then the, so the idea that um sort of the, the sexual the genital arousal um difference between uh, cis men and women well i was like if there's a difference between cis men and women, where do trans people fall on this? And there'd literally been one study done before on trans women, um, where they had a group of 11 trans women uh, basically take part. None of them had had lower surgery. They all used the penile gauge. And they were like, oh, yeah, they show like typical male arousal. And I was like, that's interesting. Like, given the sample size, they didn't have any bisexual trans women take part. And the authors of the paper, I'm not going to say who, but like, just I was suspicious. I was like, I don't know how good this is. <laughs> and I didn't really like the paper. I, I was like, I want to do this. Mm. Um, but like for me and trans men, because I want to try and get a larger sample size than 11. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 We could, I mean, because we've talked about this before. I mean, we've talked about this last week, actually. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, 11 as a small sample size could be, it's a good pilot study. You could decide maybe should we go go on with this? But when people start making... Sweeping statements. Don't make from your me. conclusions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like I spoke to I spoke to ten of my friends, and all of them are queer. So I've concluded mm -hmm. that everyone on the planet must be queer. Good yeah. study, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, also, yeah, that's a fair <laughs> fair conclusion. Yeah. Also, there are no black people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, that's not true. You need um, some black friends. I have black friends. <laughs> they just don't like you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think well, okay. This you kind of touched on something that's uh, interesting to me. Look, do you remember? Um, a, a, gosh, months and months ago, um, when you sent me a paper and you were saying, "Oh, this might be a, an interesting, th a, interesting thing to look at for Psy guys," and I started reading it and I sent, I, I sent back to you. I was like, "I am certain this was written by a turf." Is this the one that ended up being part of the BBC study? It was about. It was a, there was a BBC article on it. I, I, we don't need to go into what it specifically okay. was about, but um, I, I and I just want to ask you because you, oh, you yeah, will have read, now. yeah, you will have read a bunch of sort of studies um in regards to trans people. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like when when you start reading it, you can almost tell what someone's views on the topic are? Oh yeah, in mostly by the language they use because yes. it's mm. like so this one on like trans women, one of the authors was a big researcher in autogynephilia, which instantly just made me go, oh, well, you got a very small sample. It's literally the only study done on this. You didn't get like a huge range of like sexual attractions, like self-reported sexual attractions. And this is the conclusion you're drawing. Um, it's difficult to like quiz science yeah. too much when you weren't there and you can't see like the raw data and look at it yourself. But when you get that vibe, I always like... Yeah. suspicious well this is because i remember that that paper that luke sent me um and i i remember reading it. i was like this language feels off and i, I was like, I'm, i won't judge obviously i read the whole paper i, was like, I won't mm -hmm. judge it i'll look at it and I'll, I'll, I'll see what i think and then i was like okay i'm gonna take the author's name go to twitter <laughs> and her head her, her header on twitter oh, no. was just okay. fully like a turf slogan i was like oh, oh okay no. cool i'm glad that i i'm glad that i can you know pick that out just from just from that but it is it is interesting because I really feel like when you're looking at sort of um, trans people in science or the, the sort of science in regards to transgender people, it is such a minefield in terms of what what is influenced by what bias. And I think mm -hmm. what's really interesting um, is when you look at a lot of studies that are touted by transphobes, you'll find where they get their information from, what, what, sorry, where they get their um, participants from, where they get their data from, is really often skewed. <laughs> very heavily in a, in a, a per direction yeah. so for example i think one of the um 
uh, one of, I, I, I can't remember the specific study. So take this with a, a massive grain of salt, but I kind of remember one study talking about, um, I think it was detransitioning or um, sort of the sort of comfort or happiness of trans people after transitioning and where they got the participants or how they got the information was by asking parents of oh, that was it i just yes, remember, oh my god yes I, I distinctly remember what it was rapid onset gender dysphoria they got that oh from, is this the Littman paper yeah 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 they oh, got they got people from like mums net or from like yeah. and like they got parents from like basically trans anti-trans gender, websites. trend like li- yeah. literally like oh. these websites that <laughs> it's like what do you think of your child's uh, gender dysphoria? We're going to ask you, knowing that you've gone to websites that are trying to persuade you that your child is going through a phase. Uh-huh. Like, and then they base conclusions off of that. It was terrible. And I, I just, I, 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 honestly, what baffles me to this day is that people believe that rapid onset gender dysphoria is a thing based on a bunch of parents who were surprised by their kids coming out as trans so much so that they went to forums <laughs> to figure out what was going on instead of like to- like surely if like it wouldn't have been such a surprise if they'd had a better relationship with their child and been okay with this like- is like the ending of it's a sin the end of it's a sin where one Spoilers. of the one of the mums is like like super shocked that her son is gay um and her son is dying of aids and everyone around him knew he was gay and in part you know, he, he he hid that he was gay from his parents. And so, you know, to a certain mm-hmm. extent, you you can't necessarily expect them to read his mind. But equally, that's the sort of point is that she's sort of running around like, how 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 could I have known? Why is everybody blaming me for not having known? Um, when the reason probably that he didn't tell is because there was a sort of homophobic environment at home. Um, and that's a sort of similar sort of thing, isn't it? Is like, um, yeah, it's rapid onset if you're in denial the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. you don't spot it. And the reason that I bring this up, and it is fully related, honestly, I, 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 <laughs> I lied. There is another compliment in here that where you got, um, where you got your participants from was, um, where, where, where did you get your part- participants from? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the trans participants specifically, yeah. uh, Tumblr, like, doing twitter posts looking for trans people uh trans groups uk pride things, festivals pride university festivals. mailing lists oh and that fairs, was that was fun and online forums for transgender men mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah so you you went to like a sort of wide range of places that's my point here yeah which is and and all specifically places that don't have a sort of anti-trans agenda to mm-hmm. an extent right i mean which is i think Quite, quite. Well, I was like, I-, I want to look at trans people, therefore my participants need to be the trans people yeah. rather than making conclusions about trans people without speaking to any. Yeah, that's absolutely. what Lippmann yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, again, as well, I mean, what y- you've gone to, and this is something that I think is really important when studying, I mean, trans people or queer people in general. If you look at, so if you go through sort of the university mailing lists and the sort of pride events and, 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 all, and the sort of forums for those groups, you're going to be finding people that are, to an extent, comfortable and confident in themselves mm-hmm. more so than, th- more so than others, right? That that wouldn't be going to Pride or wouldn't mm-hmm. be wanting to speak publicly yeah. On, yeah. online mm-hmm. about it, and that makes <laughs> so much of a difference when it comes to studying, um, basically how these people are because they're, you know, living your life in the closet is a very different way to living your life, like openly, right? And mm-hmm. I think it's just I think it's interesting that that's where you find uh, interesting. I think it's really really good that's where you find the people, you know, Thank so, you. For, the, for the study. Sorry, so I can understand from a uh, layman's perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you were talking about the places that you, so Cory was celebrating your selection, your broad selection of places where you found um, participants. So the mm-hmm. old one that you were not happy about um, that selected from a specific place that was getting a specific type of person um, with specific attitudes towards um, being trans, um, what was the sample that you were, that Corey is celebrating by this broad sen- broad, broad uh, base selection process? As in the sample size? Not the sample size, but so your criticism of the previous study mm-hmm. um, was that it found um, participants from a, sp- from a specific type of place so- which would result in specific type of participants. Um, so what are, the, what are the participants that you so are celebrating could- in, this, in, the, in Jamie's study? Okay, so if I could be specific, yeah. the, what I was talking about with the uh, the ROGD uh, issue mm. was that they made a claim of um, th- th- this thing can 
it can come on quickly without any prior without any sort of prior symptoms without any prior um sort of indication of it um and it's usually it's usually related to people in that friend group also going through the same thing right the mm -hmm. issue with that is you're taking it from parents who specifically um have some issues with trans people or mm. some have some issues with their child being trans and um are cl were clearly shocked or c and, and confused about their uh, child coming out as trans mm. and so if you go to a group of people who are more inclined to be unaware of what's going on in their child's life of course you're going to see um an apparently rapid onset of something right yeah. my issue is not just in how they are sampling it is the it is the way that they're taking the data from the sample um and not recognizing that a bias in said sample yeah. so the and and on top of that what sort of jamie has done is taken uh, is taken a, a sample of trans people from like you know people that are rather than going like like you said like sort of to uh, sort of clinics which is usually mm. sort of the sort of younger trans people just starting their transition or um you know going through parents who don't want their child to be trans you're you're going to like sort of university mailing lists and pride events and mm -hmm. um online forums where you can get people who, like a sort of a, a, a different sort of range of people yeah. Do you, you understand how those, how those groups are like, how those groups are, are different from each other? Absolutely, yeah. So all I was just trying to work out is that then, as far as I've understood, your sample size, your sample, your sampling system, where you've gone to university mailing lists, mm -hmm. pride events, etc., that's is that going to result in a sample of people who are trans and also very happy to be open about being trans? And are is it going to at all be able to say anything about people who are trans or potentially trans but have trouble with it or haven't come to terms with it or you know what i mean yeah no i i mean like at the pride events you're likely to get a sample where they're all very you yeah. know at least somewhat proud of their identity um but some of the forums that i went on they were private so i only had access because i was trans myself and i was part of uh -huh. it um, and i asked their permission if i could gather like participants from there and they said i could and that had a very broad range so you had people who were like just starting off and were in the stage of like self-acceptance people who were struggling at home people who were super happy like that particular part of where i got participants was very broad in terms of the type of trans person and cool. their attitudes towards mm. their own transness yeah, yeah um so it was it was pretty broad and then other ones i got from like just putting stuff out on twitter not everybody was like out on their own profile, but they just were comfortable to contact me because I was trans You're and like safe. there's there's yeah. like trust yeah. there, which I think that's why it's really important to have more trans people yeah. do trans research as well. Cause, yeah, yeah, the participants you get are just broader because mm. there's more trust there. That's really cool. Sorry, because I'm I'm just <laughs> I'm just projecting into the future of what I think the results of your study will be, and I'm very excited. So I'm just checking all these other things <laughs> <laughs> as we go along. I like it. No, it's um, good. Like, yeah, cool. this is gonna be really cool. So every question I might have, I'll ask it as it comes up. Cool. <laughs> I love how we've got someone that actually knows knows what we're talking about yeah. when we're like because you ask them questions and they can answer it. Yeah, it's really cool. Which is great. I love I yeah. love that. Um so in in this study, uh you had 25 trans transgender men. Mm -hmm. Um you had six of them use the the penile gauge mm -hmm. and 19 used the vaginal probe, mm -hmm. which I mean again, super like a, a super interesting twist to that that you've that you've added of using this sort of small like I feel like that's yeah. something that genuinely had a, had a trans person not been behind it, that wouldn't have come about. Yeah, you know? yeah, probably. Yeah, probably not. Like, and, um, and, yeah, and I think it's just evident from like reading that um, you need more. You need more people studying, people from certain groups studying those groups, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's always this sort of like it's oh it always it feels like a sort of it's always a cis white um, straight guy studying everything else, right? Sure. And it and it always it, it, you can. <laughs> This is probably not the most scientific way of saying it, but I feel like you can feel it when you're reading when you're, when you're reading those papers. Sure, who it's who who it's come from to an extent. Sorry, another probing question. Mm -hmm. So, what were, the, <laughs> what were the numbers that it was divided up into? Six in the penile gauge and nineteen. Nineteen. 19. Yeah. Okay, and sorry, my probing question is: uh, are are any of the people using the penile gauge post op bottom surgery? Yes, five were. So one is pre op using the penile gauge yes and that was because that was me because right, i was okay. confident yeah, yeah. no because i i experimented i was gonna be like okay now luke so long as you've not asked jamie specifically about himself this will be fine <laughs> i know i'm just because 
it, it had never been done before. And yeah. I didn't want to invite trans guys in and have them feel embarrassed if yeah. it didn't work. So I was like, I will try this on myself. I hadn't had metoidioplasty at the time, yeah. but it kind of worked. But I was like, I'm not going to ask pre metoidioplasty people to use this because it was very awkward. And it's going to be like on a case by case basis on whether it's going to work. Mm -hmm. But I was confident going forward that if they had metoidioplasty, it would be okay. Um, so yeah, out of the six, five were post op. I think. Okay, so I'm. Just struggling yeah, yeah, yeah. to keep track of all the things in my head of who's using what equipment, but I will make sense of it. In so my head. I, I can keep I can I can keep a running sort of okay. tab for you, yeah. Yes. So you've got <laughs> Jesus <Yeah>. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> you've got five post bottom surgery with the gauge. One okay, pre bottom surgery. So with hang the gauge. on. This is sorry. There's and so much to keep track of. We'll, okay. We'll, okay. We'll, we'll do we'll do it when we come to it. Okay. okay. And I think this is something that's just popped into my head, but it'd be really interesting to do then. I think further studies on um, using both the gauge and the um, the the penile gauge and the uh, I forget the I forget the name of it. The vaginal probe. Yeah. Be really like to see at the same time. Yeah. We wanted to. Did you? Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> that the equipment wouldn't let us record responses at the same time. Oh, that's frustrating. Yeah. Wow. We we I like there were people who would have done it, but yeah, we just couldn't measure it. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Cool, because then it, I mean you could potentially. Never mind. I'll 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 wait till we get to the results because I mean you could potentially point to. Well, why is this? We'll we'll get to the results. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you also you had people um basically um assess their uh, sex, uh sexual attraction on the Kinsey scale. I'm sure everyone knows what the Kinsey scale is. If you don't, it's just a seven point scale for measuring sexuality. Um which which one is the which one is the gayest and which one's the straightest? Seven's the gayest, right? Seven's mm. the gayest? Yeah. Yeah, or you yeah. do like zero to six. Zero to six. So six oh yeah, because be. zero oh, yeah. is one. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, zero is yeah. one, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Six is the so, That's it. Yeah. yeah. Seven is extra gay. <laughs> <laughs> seven is too gay. Too gay. <laughs> <laughs> you are taken out of the study if you are seven. <laughs> you transcend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um so you had uh wh what was this you had um so a, a score of zero or one is exclusive uh, uh exclusive or almost exclusive attraction mm -hmm. to women you had five people um of that and then from two to four that was bisexual to varying degrees you had 16 <laughs> yes a lot of trans guys are bisexual it turns out <laughs> <laughs> i think this is i genuinely think a lot of people a lot more people would be more bisexual if there were fewer societal um Pressure is not to be. Yeah, well, the Romans my, yeah. were pretty bisexual. My, they? my supervisor said, Why do you think that all these trans guys are bisexual? And I was like, Well, they're already trans. So mm. they're probably a lot more open to exploring their sexuality. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. like if that's how you're feeling. Um, and it is, they've done studies on like trans sexuality and stuff mm. and numbers. And most trans people do not identify as strictly like straight or gay. Yeah, which is yeah. really interesting. <laughs> it's really, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's really interesting. And uh, so you've got, uh, you see, 60, 16 <laughs> bisexual, um, and then um, four um, mm -hmm. with an exclusive or almost exclusive attraction to men. So mm -hmm. four gays, uh, 16 bis, and five straights. Mm -hmm. Ugh. <laughs> 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 None of them are listening to this. <laughs> so... Um, th so that was the, the, you ha had the sample of uh, twenty five, um, and then you also had um, you also had uh, cis participant uh, cis participants, mm -hmm. um, and you had what is that one hundred seventy eight uh, cis women, one hundred forty five cisgender men. It was a lot. Yeah, you yeah, went through a lot of them, right? <laughs> yeah, it, we were working as a team, so like some of those participants were used by other members of the mm -hmm. team as well in their studies. So we all like I didn't test every single one of those, but I tested a lot. Jeez. <laughs> Man, I, mean, I just having your day to day, like, oh, I got to go to work and show someone how to put on a little, a little penis, rubber band. Penis a rubber band. <laughs> it was a whole year of my life, essentially. It was. <laughs> how did you? How did you demonstrate? Did you use like a banana? Did you use uh, we a little? Didn't demonstrate. Didn't demonstrate. It was literally just uh, describing it. So we kind of like would show people the private booth. Mm -hmm. They'd sit in the most comfortable chair on the entire campus. That's what we told them, you know, <laughs> make them feel special. And then the device would just be like in a kind of plastic bag. So it was like sanitary and stuff. Mm. And we just point it out and say, this is how you use it. Like with the rubber band, just be like, you pull it like that. You place it halfway down your penis, make sure there's no rolls in it. There's instructions on the wall. There's the intercom. When you're ready or any problems, let us know. We're over there. Fair and enough. that was it. Cool. That was and Fair like 99% yeah. of people were absolutely fine. 
Okay. Yeah. Good. Does yeah. It, do you have to calibrate it? Yes. How does that work? Oh God, I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> um, with the okay, with the ga- the probe didn't really need calibrating. We just kind of um, like set it running for a bit and opened the door and closed the door to make sure it was detecting light. Yeah. And then with the gauge, we had like a a very odd looking cone that went smaller to larger oh, and we yeah. had specific points on it that we calibrated the device and just checked that it matched up on our screen um, and we had different calibrations for the gauge we used on cis men and for trans men because they were different sizes um, I completely forgot about that bit yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and uh, when you look at the cisgender people you had 60 um, uh, 60 cisgender women and 74 cisgender men that had um, an exclusive or almost exclusive attraction to women um, which that is a lot of that is a lot of cis women that were exclusively attracted to women we went to a lot of prides oh you went to Europe people mm-hmm. pride yeah okay that yeah. makes sense yeah okay that, yeah mm-hmm. that adds up um, and then you had uh, 39 uh, uh, cisgender women and 28 cisgender men uh, who were bisexual and then um, uh, five, wait, what was this? Oh, yes. Uh, 79 cisgender women and 43 cisgender men who were, um, who had an exclusive or almost exclusive attraction to yeah. men. So, yeah, I mean, the n- numbers are very, very, way fewer um, bisexual people in the cisgender group than yeah. the trans group, which it's is really interesting. Interesting. There's no, I, I have no idea why. No, um, I mean, but yeah, most of the straight cis people were recruited from campus. Mm. And then <clears throat> most of the gay people were recruited from Pride events. It worked out quite nicely. That's fair enough. Quite but yeah, shocking how up for like watching porn for money students can be. <laughs> <laughs> like... I mean, it's it's one thing that they want and mm-hmm. one thing they'd be doing anyway. We had so many people offer to do it for free, but ethically we had to give them money. <laughs> so because <laughs> like loads of the guys were just like. I do that for free. Sure. I'll do it. Yeah. yeah. Man. man, I put a little rubber band on. I do it for myself, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's like, no, we have to give you money. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, I want to talk about the stimuli here, uh, which... Well, we've already started, so continue. <laughs> yeah, no, I, no I, I, I want a little more specific because it's it's very fun uh, reading about a pornographic video in a, in a oh, paper. Sorry, did I just drop that in there right as you were about to describe it's it? It's totally fine. <laughs> uh, it's... <laughs> <laughs> the videos were three minutes long um, with three featuring a male model and this is a direct quote and three featuring a female model masturbating these stimuli had been previously selected to be the most arousing videos from a large pool and that's from a 2015 <laughs> paper uh, by I think Rieger et al um, yeah. <laughs> voted for by the people so did somebody do a scientific paper on the most sexually arousing videos they had to do like a prequel paper to select the oh, okay. pornographic videos they were then going to use in an arousal paper. Right. So it had to be like scientifically selected and it had to be lone people masturbating rather than people having sex because yeah. they found that you don't know what people get aroused to when it's two people having sex. Yeah. Um, but it was very boring. What were the what did the videos <laughs> look like? Were they in a what, what were the rooms like? Because you'd have to so were the mm. do you know if the videos were made um, sort of exclusively for the study or did they find them else no they were found on porn sites really yeah well what if what if perhaps a, a, a pink pillow were to infl- <laughs> what if you're not <laughs> you know attracted I mean? to people That's... masturbating we did get like a few comments from people going that was really boring porn that was like really <laughs> like just that's not what i watch i'm not into individual people but then it's like you still got aroused like the right, pe- like okay. even the people who would verbally come out and say that was really boring <laughs> and the, their graph is like saying yeah. the opposite of that. <laughs> they still they still got turned on by it right but, Good but i think that's but i think that's different i think there's two there's two different kinds of arousal you know i mean there's I, really because you can be physically aroused without feeling like ooh all horny you know that don't make you guys know mm. no or the yeah, other right. Yeah. oh right okay yeah. i see yeah. you're yeah. like you're like oh this is I, I i don't really find this attractive but evidently someone does we um, did also take like uh people voted after each sexual video they voted on how attractive they found that person really? but there's a really odd question of like would you date this person and like so many people were like no mm. like that's not it's not really a relevant question in your like <laughs> attraction in this three minute video yeah. of somebody naked like yeah. You, you, yeah otherwise tinder would just be videos of people masturbating and you swipe like right or left yeah. based on that right naked um, attraction right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so no, go on no just typically uh like for cis men the kind of genital arousal would correlate with these self-reported responses on the specific models 
So, like, even if they found it boring, they would still say, yeah, they were attractive. Yeah. Fair enough. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, th again, what is interesting as well is <laughs> that you've had to put the the resolution of the screen that... <laughs> I didn't the, even know what it was. I was just told. <laughs> 768 by 536 pixels. That's, well, that's quite wondering. small, actually. What crappy little screen are you using? Yeah. Yeah. It's smaller like than an iPhone 4. It was like, okay, the screen even in the booth was like the size of your TV over there. And mm -hmm. it was like up on the wall and people were sat like watching like this. So it's like an it's old CRT monitor. Yeah, it's a low something. resolution screen. It was, it was old. Really? It was oh. reasonably, yeah, like it's not Classic. modern stuff. It's not vintage, but it's not modern. <laughs> it's getting there. It's getting yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you watched <laughs> it. A couple and, more years. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, this is from like at least 10 plus years ago. Yeah. This is, yeah, they're not looking the same now, are they? No. Uh, you then kind of just talk about how you measured um, the arousal, which honestly, I, I, I'm not going to read out because it's about the hertz, megahertz. I think it's just going to switch you all off to sleep yeah it's gonna no play. i'm very interested in that of course, hertz yeah, megahertz are. of the heartbeat uh, so the amplitude signal was sampled at 200 hertz and high pass filtered at 0 0.5 hertz with 16 bits resolution amplitude was measured as peak to trough amplitude for each vaginal pulse yeah sure yeah 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 i understand what that means good yeah, cool. there you go <laughs> that's really really interesting that you have to give that information I suppose, yeah, yeah. You give, you give it's, like, all the it, the, right? the whole point. Obviously, the whole point is like so people can replicate it. Yeah. So it has to be like really precise. I was explained; those numbers were explained to me when I was doing it, but I I can't remember. I have no idea what it means. I'm just like, okay, cool. That's the stuff I usually skim unless I want to really dig into how they did it. And like, <laughs> it's just I don't need to know this specific stuff to get yeah. the general overview of certain things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and you obviously got consent. That's one of the first things <laughs> that you mentioned. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> um, and then, yeah, you basically just you basically in the procedure part, you basically just uh, you write about what you've just told us now about. How you mm -hmm. sit them down and just tell them, go at it, you know. Um, go at it. As in, <laughs> no, 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 as in, person. get it on, put the and get the get the sort of right. Get yourself okay, sorted not, out. No, okay. no, not going at it. They're no, not masturbating to this porn with the little oh, rubber no, band but, on. But we have to like, oh, we were supposed to be telling people you can't touch yourself. Like if you get aroused You'd by hope this, they, you we, come on, you're in a but lab. But it was a very awkward thing to say. Yeah, and I seemed to. I think it was written inside the booth, so I hands on the I'm side of the honest. cart at all times during mm. the ride. And like for people using the probe, they had to sit still as well because, yeah, like, of course. Yeah, yeah, and we had them on like you know the neck pillows for of flying. Yeah. They were sat on one of those to take the pressure off. But of all people I yeah. know in my life, the last person I think who would be who I would peg as being you know the one that would say, "Hey, go into this booth and put this thing on your genitals and then come out." Um, and, and after watching this bit of porn you were the last person I think would do that I was very awkward the first couple of ones I literally stood there and read it off a sheet with a, mm. like a wavy voice just like eh, then you put this over your penis <laughs> 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 and I was very anxious and then the, the most awkward thing is we had to test in pairs because just like ethics and because we're testing with people just to make sure everybody's safe um, there was a monitor on our side of the booth with the porn plane so literally we would sit there and it's there and it's so loud in the booth that we could hear it. So you're sat at work in a university with porn playing out loud. And I had to sit and, and watch that with my supervisor one time because he was like, oh, I want to introduce you to the lab. And this was before I knew what the lab did. Um, and so we walk in and there's just porn on the screen. And I'm like, I wasn't expecting this. What do you do here? I feel like yeah. you should be warned about that sort of thing. I know. Well, I, he assumed I knew. And then, like, we were just sat down testing somebody, and my supervisor's on my left, and then there's a screen showing porn, and you can hear it. And I'm just like, hmm, okay. okay. This I'm is a lovely day. Dear me. This is it's just really fascinating to me that there's enough studies about this going on, that there's a permanent lab set up for this purpose. Yeah. Right. Oh, do you know what? Another, I keep on thinking of fun things to, fun things to do. If I had this lab, I would just be doing things all the time. Yeah. Um, like, so, okay. So for example, people that say they're not, no, 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 no. People that say they're not aroused by the, um, the, the sort of the videos that you're showing them. I think it'd be interesting just to keep on showing it to them and see what happens. That's Whether it's, called torture, Corey. No, 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 no. Well, it's not, if well, they don't dislike it, just to see if, um, if they're, if, if it changes. Right, if showing the same thing that you say, ah, oh, this is boring, 
over and over if that affects your arousal. Eventually, you're just like, we, oh, actually. We did have some people come in multiple times mm -hmm. and it didn't seem <laughs> to decrease. The porn. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I mean, it was like, if we, got, uh, <laughs> if we got like an unusual response. So, what's a very, an, a really unusual response is to have a bisexual over, cis I've guy legitimately show like equal arousal to every single video. So, we had a few guys like that and they would come back in and take part a few times. And it didn't, they didn't seem to get like bored. And then the guy who set the lab up, not my supervisor, another student, he was the tester. So he did it a lot. Jeez. So poor guy. Yeah. Oh, no. um, so why don't we talk about the results and kind of the discussion around those results? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Do you, yeah. Remember, do you remember them? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Generally. So um, you've, I will, do you know what? I'm going to read it verbatim because I always think it's best to do that when it comes to. Mm -hmm sort of the results and discussion portions. Uh, it says, present findings suggest, well, not present anymore, past findings now, but present findings suggested the existence of both male typical and female typical sexual arousal, arousal patterns in transgender men because they showed some gender specific sexual arousal similar to cisgender men, but also showed bisexual arousal similar to cisgender women. Do you want to talk mm -hmm. about, do you want to talk about your results a little bit? Um, yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> Like translate uh, this for um, everyone else listening. Basically, overall, we found that kind of among like straight and gay trans men, they were attracted to the gender that they self-reported being attracted to. And that's the pattern we would find in cis men. But the kind of bisexual responses were stronger. So they, they were basically like more bisexual in essence um, than would typically be seen in cisgender men, uh, which is what made it somewhat more female typical but actually the research is kind of opening up a bit more and accepting that bisexual men are, are a thing like bisexual cis men exist because it used to be a big thing of like oh these cis men are coming in saying they're bisexual and their arousal actually isn't mm. bisexual but like subsequent studies have found that actually it was probably just a bad sample mm. for that one um, what there were people who were saying i'm bisexual but weren't showing arousal to both sexes when shown videos or fit yeah pictures. not not in not in my study but in like a yeah. previous study that was looking into like the existence of cisgender bisexual men there were but there were like men coming in saying like yeah i'm bi and then showing like significantly stronger arousal either to just like men or to women and not really showing a bisexual response wow which led to this kind of wrong conclusion of like is bisexuality in men a myth uh, and then, yeah, and then subsequent studies were done with more stringent criteria for recruitment mm. of bisexual men. And it was like, actually, no, bisexual men are just that they, they exist. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And again, something that's in, it, that is interesting that sets this sort of paper out for this, these studies apart from others is that in, in what you're talking about there with, oh, do bisexual men exist? Yes, they do. You cannot scientifically prove that bisexual men don't exist. And it, it's the same, I guess, when it comes to trans people as well. When people try to scientifically prove, oh, trans people don't exist. Uh, yes, they do. <laughs> the, all these groups of people exist because they say they exist. That is mm -hmm. enough in our like in our society to garner their like their existence. If you want to figure out why people turn out to be trans or gay or bi or whatever, that's a question you can ask. Or you mm -hmm. could ask, how does being trans or bi or gay affect X thing? Mm. These are all perfectly fine questions to ask, but when your question is, does this group exist? Yes. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to, do you know what I mean? <laughs> you wouldn't be able to study them. I mean, I, I understand where they're coming from to an extent, but it almost speaks to a sort of desire to invalidate a group of people that, that, that for, for no reason, really. Oh, yeah, it was dodgy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dodgy, right? Yeah. 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 I'm just asking, are they all lying, really? Well, mm. yeah, I, I mean, I saw uh, way back when I was reading this paper about trans women that was basically saying um, there were two types of trans women. There were the gay men and, oh gosh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I think it was basically gay men that go too far into being gay. Oh yeah, I think it was gay men and um, AGP. I was kind of feeling. Oh it. yeah. I think it was, those those were the two things. They were, and I think it tries to propose that trans women of a specific sexual, like, whenever you look at people trying to invalidate trans people, so often they forget that bisexual trans people can exist or, mm -hmm. or or things like that. It's always actually they're just confused and about their sexuality. Yeah. And what Jamie did is very specifically multiple times highlight the separation of sexuality and gender mm -hmm. um, in that paper. And I mean, it was really good because so yeah. often you see them being conflated, which leads to really 
muddy results. It's like, imagine, I mean, uh, understandably, they're obviously like um, linked to some degree, but it, it's, it, it's just like sort of societally, they're linked to some degree. But I, it, like, when you're studying scientifically, viewing them as being intrinsically linked and exactly mm. the same thing is so problematic. Yeah. Like you get such shitty results from it. Well, it's like people who say like, oh, you're uh, like a, a gay trans guy. That just sounds like being a straight woman with extra steps kind of thing. That's like the, <laughs> eh, that's, yeah. Yeah. Why don't you, I mean, if you're, what is it? If you're, a... wait, hold on. Straight trans guy. That's like. If you're a gay trans guy, gay that's trans like guy. being yeah, a straight yeah, woman with it, extra yeah. steps. It's just so dodgy and people are like, oh, why not just be this? And The thing that I, that I see so often is when people say, oh, you're a, you are a straight trans guy. Why not just be a very butch lesbian? Probably because, probably because that's 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 Wait, not what? right. Yeah, no. it's, not, it's just not what it is. It's just not what's going on. Completely different identity. <laughs> <laughs> so, can't just can't just switch that on. You know, like oh, actually, yes, I would like to have a little bit less discrimination, so I will go and and be cisgender now. But you but... mean that? Tra- that trans guys could have been lesbians this whole time? Someone mm. needs to get this the word out. Like, someone like, needs to tell them. Like, are you telling me I could have been cis? Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I'd have known sooner. We had a choice. I, lo- I Honestly, I love the I love when people come, come with sort of a revelation of like, you know you could have done this thing the whole time. Do you really think someone would have gone, like, gone through transitioning without mm. thinking of basically everything else oh, first? I never thought about that. Right? It's like, <laughs> it's like I had four surgeries you. for no reason. Thank you. Oh, shit. <laughs> All that money oh, wasted. Should have thought about it some more. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you've got you've got some really like you, you've got good results here. I really I, I really like I really liked the Thank sort you. of reading. It was an enjoyable read. Um, you, you say that it sort of what you found was different from a sort of previous study that looked mm-hmm. into a similar thing in trans women, the one that you were talking about earlier. I right? had a sentence in that really like dug into that study, and my supervisor was like, "That's too unprofessional." Really? Yeah. Uh, he was like you're not going to get published with that in there fair enough and i was like "Mm." i have seen i have seen people call out other people really like really i mean it was also his supervisor's paper so right okay that was yeah that was i was like this naive phd student trying to like discuss stuff with somebody who'd come from a very transphobic (laughs) scientific background but was not transphobic themselves but just the knowledge they had was not good so I struggled a lot with terminology. Like I mm. wanted actually to describe sexual orientation as like sexual orientation labels and just mm. explain how it works for trans people. And he was like, that's too confusing. And he did let me submit a paper with it in and they rejected it. But like, and one of the that, reasons yeah. was like, that's too confusing. And I was like, but you accepted it being like the wrong labels for years and oh, yeah, I could I mean, go on. Sorry. I think no, I, honestly, I, I I remember you talking about this, and I, I, that's mm. one of the reasons why you come and talk because it was mm. it's so interesting. I think honestly as well, the way that you, again I, I've said it before, but the way you've described everything in this paper, I think is that happy sort of medium or the the, the best way of going forward of just this is who people are attracted to, this is gender, this mm-hmm. is sex, mm. and it's just the, it's just it's so straightforward. It's so it's so easy to understand, regardless of how much you understand about the sort of trans yeah. topics in general um and what you've got here is is another little interesting thing we'll be wrapping up in a sec but um you said that the penile gauges um captured arousal in post-op trans men um and didn't lead to different patterns of sexual responses as compared to trans men using the vaginal probe mm-hmm. um and obviously that as you've said in the paper you used a very small number of trans men using the yeah probe. we couldn't uh, actually using the, yeah the using gauge, the gauge sorry, the gauge sorry we yeah. couldn't and we didn't draw any conclusions from those using the gauge. It was mm-hmm. more just speculative of like, it looks like it's a valid measure, but yeah. more needs to be done. Yeah. But the patterns are the same. We're getting the same results from Which both groups. Yeah. And yeah. I, I mean, if it, I genuinely, I mean, obviously you, you want to do this, but I think it'd be really interesting to see something in the future. Um, if like when possible, looking at using, um, using both. Um, yes. On, it, it'd just be interesting. To see, yeah. To see mm-hmm. what the results would be. Because those results go some of the way to like, quashing some claims that the difference between cisgender men and women is because of the devices used Mm. so like if you're using within the same group of people two different devices and you're finding the same results it's kind of indicating that maybe it's not the devices maybe there is something going on and and yeah i mean a big part of the paper was saying like gender has an impact on our like by like physiological responses and it's not just uh down to our kind of biology would it be possible mm-hmm. to do this with uh, some kind of MRI as well, or a 
one of those caps that measures electrical activity in the brain. Um, I don't know what, what the electrical activity is like during arousal in the brain. I think it can be possible, but it's not something I've read about. Mm. Like, honestly, there are other ways of measuring arousal. Um, but EG cap? I don't know. I've not read anything. Mm. Yeah. I suspect. I mean, so. this is, this way is easier, probably. Yeah, I think <laughs> MRI would. I think you probably could use an MRI about the expanse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in this, you had so twenty of twenty of the uh, the guys that you used uh, uh, were using testosterone. <laughs> Sorry, I just read testosterone supplements. I've never. I've never read it as that before, but obviously, yeah. Um, it had to be very formal. Some of my drafts, my supervisor would just send back and be like, "This is just too informal, Jamie." Like, <laughs> it's really, it's that's what I said. It's really funny to read this, being like, "Oh, this is these are Jamie's words here talking about something that Jamie talks about informally very often." <laughs> like, <laughs> X number on T, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, so yeah, uh, and you, you didn't you didn't see any differences, or you didn't see any reliable differences, rather, um, um, between the group with testosterone and without. But obviously, the group without testosterone, you only had five of those, mm. and so that isn't you couldn't you couldn't draw any. Conclusions it's a from that. shame. I was disappointed because I knew that like one of the biggest pushbacks from like skeptics and stuff over this research would be, oh, it's all just testosterone then. Ugh, oh, yeah. our like arousal is driven by testosterone. Um, which I can understand why people would say that, but actually, uh, the we only had five, but they seem to follow the same pattern. And the, the actually the most male typical response that we had from a trans guy was from a straight trans guy who was pre testosterone, mm. which doesn't I can't make any conclusions. It doesn't say that much, but it's just like I know it. So I want more to be done with larger samples. How much do you know off, off the top of your head? How much do you know the, the sort of overlap in? So obviously it, it exists on kind of like um, what's the like a sort of a sort of curve, right? As in there are going to be people that are sort of um, at either ends of the sort of spe of a sort of spectrum of mm -hmm. male typical and sort of female typical responses, mm -hmm. right? Do you, if, is there much overlap there in the responses? Do you know between what, cis like, males? But, and sorry, cis, yeah. sorry, between uh, but sorry, cis between yeah, between uh, cis men and cis women uh, within. Cis women, lesbians can sometimes have like more male typical responses, but they're like weakly male typical. Mm -hmm. And so, like, is think of it as like a step progression of like cis women responses are here, and then lesbians can be like a little bit higher up, and then our trans men are like up here, and then your cis men are here. So, it's like there is some overlap within the groups, but we can typically broadly separate them that's fair enough yeah, yeah. i'm just curious because you know this is when obviously the word typical is such a <laughs> <laughs> it has to be used <laughs> no, 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 it's, a, it's a great it's a, it's a great word but also when you're reading it you're like what does it what ex what specifically do you mean by, by this how much overlap is there because you know you could use typical to mean yeah so it's so many different sort of um what kind of typical are we talking? Yeah, exactly. Which, <laughs> which, which type of typical? Um, so basically your conclusion from this is that trans men can show some male typical and some female typical um, sexual arousal mm -hmm. patterns. Yeah. Um, and that obviously gender seems to have some kind of an, an influence. Yeah. Um, but further study is needed. Yes. Right? Yeah. Because like, yeah. you know, technically we can't completely rule out the role of testosterone and the sample 25 is yeah it's all right but it's not it's not good enough to like draw proper conclusions on we need more studies larger samples but it's promising mm -hmm. i'd say that the, they were more male typical than female typical cool yeah. awesome and what do you think just in case anyone hasn't figured this out yet about a sort of you as a trans person doing this research on trans people like what effect do you think that's kind of had on on the part of getting the participants they like actually because mm. i feel like obviously you being trans yourself makes this a much easier study to do. It made it much easier to get participants, yeah. but I think it made it harder for it to be respected mm. as like a genuine piece of research because the natural assumption is that, oh, oh well, the, like the, the researcher was just biased. Like he's trans. Obviously he wanted to find this, but I went into it with the only other study on trans people into sexual arousal showing the results that I wouldn't want to find, mm. the, the one on trans women. But I was like, maybe that's what I will find. And I just need to accept what the results say. Um, and I was working with somebody who would never let any bias. Yeah. Like would not let my biases impact the results. So hmm. there was like yeah. things that made it easier and things that made it harder. Can so, I just ask a question on that? Mm -hmm. um, what What is it that um, makes you 
think that probably it's not to do with testosterone. Um, what, I just, I'm just interested in why yeah. you are sure about that or why you feel mm. fairly sure about it. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of it comes from just like anecdotal knowledge and talking to people. Um, but the although we only had like five people who hadn't started testosterone, mm. we had several more who were incredibly early, mm. who were like uh, like one to three three or one to six months ish who also showed the same patterns like everybody was kind of converging with the same pattern of results um which makes me kind of i feel like if it was done with a larger sample and more people who were pre-testosterone we would find the same thing but i can't know for sure i was like yeah i was just interested to know what it was that that made you feel um like inclined in that direction yeah yeah yeah. but But yeah i think that just to just to hop on that i think that everyone like when you're looking at your your own research you kind of have your own thoughts right you've got mm. a hypothesis but i wouldn't just uh, just i uh, not just to be nitpicking about the way that i was raised i don't think you're saying that like oh i think that this is like this is what i'm this is how you operate you just sort of you you op- you don't sort of operate based on that assumption you just have the hypothesis that you're like this needs to be tested but, yeah and like based on kind of the limited results we have right now my hypothesis would be that yeah. testosterone doesn't have an impact or has like a minimal impact on the right. pattern of sexual arousal. And I, yeah. I, I say that just because I know that people listening, it's very difficult to sort of parse the difference between how sort of scientists um, talk about their thoughts on things, right? Because you can have a hypothesis um, that you're that you think, okay, I need to prove that, but then you can also have a bias which you don't really prove in any way. So like, if you were to say, oh yeah, I think this with no intention of sort of proving it or thinking like being like, oh, this anecdotal evidence is enough. Mm, mm. That is, those are two very different things. And sort of talking on the bias, I think it's really interesting mm. that you point out that it's hard for that to be, that sort of research to be respected because the person that did it is a trans man. But mm. so much of the research that is anti-trans comes from people with an anti-trans bias, mm. um, <laughs> which is, and that bias is completely ignored. And it's almost as though, oh, you're not Funny able that. to, yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> you're not able to study this yeah. um, unless you're unless you're not trans. But what generally, what kind of people are going to be studying trans people that aren't trans? Like, what kind of cis people are going to be studying trans people? Generally? Well, hopefully more in the coming years. But right yeah. now, either trans people or people who don't believe it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. either it's yeah. either transphobes, people with their own theories around people being trans, like autogynophilia, mm. uh, like people who think that way, uh, or clinicians. Mm-hmm. People like just mm. the, the people who work in gender clinics who are like, yeah. I want to do some research on these patients. Mm. And I think I think mm. it's interesting as well because, like, I mean, what 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 often happens, and this happens with uh, tr- uh, sort of turfs, that uh, turfs in science all the time, is that they say they kind of say, oh, my my beliefs on this topic are informed by the the science, by the evidence there, but this when you look into it, so often the science seems to be quite heavily informed by by like the anti-trans bias, bias, bias in the first <laughs> mm-hmm. place so when you get when you like when you start digging into it, you're like oh you, you know scooby-doo taking off the mask it's like oh you just don't like trans people my bias that's, is informed by the science which is informed <laughs> by the bias exactly full loop. <laughs> I, I did read that and i tried to find actual science bias. they were talking about someone else's bias yeah, was, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> i mean a lot of the papers that come from like anti-trans rhetoric and stuff are from like philosophy departments which there's nothing wrong with but it's like they're talking about like science and scientific findings but they're basing a lot of their own conclusions on twitter polls and Mm. things they've read on reddit and stuff like that and that was actually like somebody found that that a lot of like the philosophy papers from turfs are based on reddit what the, this is, I just, what the yeah. fuck? This is what, what bothers me about what bothers me oh, about sorry. Trans, oh, <laughs> what <laughs> what bothers me about transphobes in general, and this goes for most sort of bigots, people that are sort of homophobic and stuff as well. Mm. It always comes down to disgust. Like you can pretty much peel away everything, and then it's just oh this this thing disgusts me. Like oh, I'm homophobic, but why are you homophobic? Because gay people are evil. Blah blah blah. But when you dig into it they just find it a little bit disgusting yeah mm. and it, icky it's just that like sort of <laughs> icky it's like on a on a like a low level and then they rationalize it with all exactly. this other stuff on top of that's it that's exactly yeah. what like, like gender critical turfs do it's mm. like they're they're basically trying to come up with a rationale for being transphobic and that's why it's become so mainstream because it mm. doesn't sound like transphobia because they're just like we don't want men in women's changing rooms when people don't know they're talking about trans women. Exactly. Like, 
But it, it's it's so frustrating because it's so easy to just peel away and dig down and be like, oh, you felt a little bit disgusted and you didn't know what to do about it, so you decided that they were the problem. And you didn't want to be a bad guy. Yeah, cool. So yeah, you you just you were disgusted and we're like, okay, but how how does this make me the victim? Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about this a little while ago. When we were talking about cognitive bias, where like cog like. Like Corey says all the time, everyone's a little bit racist. We talk about this on the on the program. Everyone has a cognitive bias mm -hmm. because you can't have not growing mm -hmm. up in our culture and everyone will be a little bit homophobic, everyone will be whatever, etc. It's mm -hmm. not. You can work on it and you will eventually eradicate it, hopefully, but you, you will pick things up. It's not yeah. necessarily a critic a critic uh, a critique of you as an individual to yeah. say you might have picked up some oh, yeah, bias. It's something that you, instead of getting defensive over, people just need to like be open to and yeah. accept it. But yeah. we were talking about how like, if you've got that, like, because I, I did a bunch of um, these uh, cognitive bias studies and found it really interesting, like uh, questionnaires <laughs> and found it really interesting, like yeah. how it worked. And that sort of taught me that like, if I have a cognitive bias one way, um, if somebody of a certain... Um, uh, minority, for example, um, be that sex, sexual minority, race minority, whatever, in this country at least, um, the things I notice about them, the things I, my brain presents with to me, mm -hmm. um, are a result of my bias. Mm -hmm. So, like, so, so for example, someone walks up to you um, and they happen to be of a certain race, and you then notice that they're wearing a hoodie and their hoods up. It's like, well, w would you have noticed they're a hoodie and their hoods up if they were a different race, for mm -hmm. example? Um, but you've created that rationality of, oh, uh, I'm treating them this way because of they've got a hoodie and their hood's up, mm -hmm. rather than to notice that you notice they've got a hoodie and their hood <laughs> up because of a cognitive <laughs> bias. Yeah. That might not be a good example, but like that's the rationale that happens mm. on top of it that's actually revealing an underlying cognitive bias. That makes sense? Mm. Yeah. 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 No, oh, it's interesting. It's 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 really interesting to sort of dig into that. And I think really we've kind of come towards the end of the episode. I think the last thing I really want to say is just it's really cool that you did that, Jamie. Thanks. Yeah, well Yay. done. Yay. I had fun. Yeah. Yay. Anything else? Anything else anyone wants to add before we before we move on to the next little part? Huh? Thanks for having me. That's nice. <laughs> so say that to your mum. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we move to the quick fire quiz? Okay. It's a quick fire quiz round. Bam bam bam. Um, trans arousal edition. <laughs> 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 There's always a different edition. Everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dear, mate. So the quick fire quiz is very simple. Jamie, I'll explain the rules of the quick fire quiz oh, for no. you and all the audience. Don't you worry, it's very, very easy. It's well, a quiz about your PhD. <laughs> We're definitely gonna lose. Well, yeah. Put it this way. I I ask a question based on something that I have said in the episode. Most of the time <laughs> most of the time I have to give a hint. But it is um, only one question. <laughs> We're We're wrong often. So just a little explainer. I will ask one question. That's one question between the three of you. The first person to buzz in with the correct answer after I've finished asking the question wins. And Jap, what do they win? Nothing. Gosh darn right. <laughs> so why don't I we... I don't have a buzzer. So Luke, what is your buzzer? Ooh. It's a, Ooh. It's a razzle. Oh. Jap, what <laughs> is that your buzzer? That could be yours. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jap, what is your buzzer? <laughs> what type of razzle is that? The best. <laughs> <laughs> that's what sound. That's what sound the penile gauge makes when you when you ping it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's if it's on wrong. <laughs> and Jamie, what is your buzzer? I'll go with the oh. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Ooh. Fantastic. So my question for you all is: <clears throat> How many trans men were involved in Jamie's study on oh. 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 Luke, I think you got there first. <laughs> How many trans men? Uh, Twenty-four. Someone coming in for the steal. 25. Uh, oh. oh, Jamie? 25. Well done. No. Good job. You won. <laughs> I can't add. <laughs> I said the number, at the, you know, when, when we started. So that's okay. Well done, Jamie. I'm glad you got this one. I did actually know it. So, yeah. 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 Good. <laughs> I remembered one thing. Well, I think that's mostly it for now. Jamie, where can everyone find you? Oh dear. In Not your house. In the right porn lab. Right <laughs> yeah, in the in human the... sexuality lab. That's yeah, it. Porn lab. No, Not the porn lab. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, Jammy Dodger online. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or at his house in. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> no <Your> local biscuit <laughs> aisle. <laughs> 
So that is it for this episode. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank Jamie. you for having me. And before we go, we would like to thank all of our patrons and thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday and why not leave us a nice wee comment. You can support the pod at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys or you can join the community on our Discord or you can contact us at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod at gmail.com. You can follow me at NotCorey everywhere. You can follow me at Jamkin everywhere. You can follow me at Luke Cutforth everywhere. Oh, and I'm Jammy Dodger. Yeah. Most places. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Why have Jammy Dodgers not sued you for taking their, their name? It's spelled it's differently. Spelled differently. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>